All right, so this lecture is about hash functions. Hash functions are kind of one of the workhorses in cryptography, and for the split between public key and symmetric key cryptography, they're typically put with uh, symmetric key cryptography, even though the definition we'll be giving doesn't involve any key. So it's more like a no key rather than a single key or two key um, scheme. Now, the motivation for hash functions is that we often want to have um, some way to take a big piece of data uh, and represent it by a short handle, something to, to look up for, with. And when you looked at the uh, PGP keys for the two teaching assistants, Alex and Mohammed, then you also had to look up their PGP by their fingerprints. So the URL you followed had actually a short string 0x something, which was then sent to the key server to expand for well, what is the key that belongs to this fingerprint? And then it gave you a more than 4,000 bit key back. And that is very convenient because you can't just look things up like that, but you can type this one or you can photograph it and verify that you got the right thing. So for instance, I have uh, a fingerprint of my PGP key on the business card. And we also want this to be the case that if you have a small change in the data, say, um, not my key, but Alex's key or Mohammed's key, then it should be giving you a very different handle. I mean, else it wouldn't be much good if this handle would be given one uh, of 500 different keys, which all have the same handle, because you want to send me an email or you want to send the TAs some email. So in the picture, when we looked at um, authentication, but also signatures, we had these where we're flipping some bits, Eva's trying to modify the data, and then it turned from something which we understand how to decrypt into something which looks pretty random or some valid signature into something which is non-valid. Other properties we might want to have from this fingerprint is that one cannot compute it without knowing all of the data. So it's also sort of a commitment. So I could tell you, hey, I don't want to give you the information yet. I've made the uh, exam already, but I'm not going to tell you what was on the exam. You have to wait till January for that. But I can commit to this by showing, by proving that I have the exam now and when you then receive it in January, you can verify that what I give you then actually matches what I have now. So in that sense, you want to make sure that I couldn't have changed any line in the exam and that I really had it, that I don't just give you an empty promise that everything is done already. Honest answer. I'm not done with the exam yet, it's a much bigger average with online exams. But that would be another motivation for a fingerprint. We also would like to have that the outputs are, well, close to uniformly distributed. Something we often use uh, these hash functions for is to take data and store it at the right location so that we can deduplicate the data. Do I have this photo already? So for instance, when you're uploading your pictures or you're uploading a video, they, the, the services don't want to store all of those in, in duplicate or triplicate. They want to have a short version uh, where they can look up, hey, did I get this already? If so, then I just store a pointer, yes, person A also owns that video, rather than storing a second copy of the video. And then you want to have that those, well, are you need to it else? You will be getting a different video next time but also they don't overflow it. So you're storing the data at the place that this fingerprint points to, and if all videos would match that bucket rather than this one, then this storage location would overflow and the other ones would be empty. Also, it should be possible to reconstruct the data from the fingerprint. Well, kind of obviously because the fingerprint is much, much smaller, but you shouldn't learn any information from it. Like if I give you a fingerprint on the exam, um, it would be bad enough if you could reconstruct exercise 5 from it. And no, it shouldn't be possible. So that also means our fingerprints are not just taking the last bits of the data, for instance. We could say, hey, our, our fingerprints are just like uh, the data mod 10 or the data mod 1000 or something like this. But that would be not good for the last item. So that brings us to the definition of a cryptographic hash function. So the properties that we want from a cryptographic hash function, well, for once, it should be able to map strings of arbitrary length to a fixed length fingerprint. So this zero one star means um, these are all strings, well, they have finite length, but the length is arbitrary. 
So you can hash something with 5 bits, you can hash something with 5 gigabytes or a terabyte. Of course, the cost will be proportional to the, to the length of the data, but the hash function should be able to handle any input length. And then a secure hash function satisfies the following three properties. So this is basically what my requirements from the previous slide crystallize into. If somebody gives you a Y and says, yep, I picked some random, uh, some, some secret X, I'm not going to tell you, that's the exam, for instance. Um, I picked some X and here is the Y. Then it should be hard for you to find that X. And actually it should be hard to find any X. So even if you don't find the exam or something, you shouldn't even be able to find any other possible data that matches this field. So that means if y is fixed and known to be in the image of some x, then, well, finding any of those x should be hard. Well, of course, information theoretically it's possible because those exist. We have the large set mapping to a smaller one. And I promise you that y is actually in the image, but it should be computationally hard to identify one of those. Now, second pre-image resistance is looking very, very similarly, similar, but the difference is that I actually give you an X that maps to this Y and then give you that exercise to find a second value. Now at that point, I could have a very strange hash function, which is many to one almost everywhere, and then this X is one to one, so there is no other X to find. Well, that would be a very oddly distributed a hash function and this requirement is normally well any x and then find any x prime so it shouldn't just be a, a single weird value so the difference to the beginning is yes we again have like that the x fixes some y and typically there are many and it should be hard to find them but in this case it's actually possible that there is no second range that would be a very very odd property here if you restrict the hash function to something where we don't take strings of arbitrary length, but say a string of fixed length, then it is possible that there is no other second range. It might also be possible if I don't give you an image of something like pick a random y in the image domain, um, that then there is no pre-image. And then the final property is collision resistance. So that is uh, lifting all the restrictions and it says just find any x and x prime that have the same image. So here you have the full flexibility to choose any target that you want. So if you can find pre-images or second pre-images, then you typically also can find collisions unless you have the identity function, which, well, given that it's zero one star, you don't have. Um, so collision resistance gives you a lot more flexibility and still it should be computationally hard to find any pair xx prime which map to the same image. Now, if you want to construct such a hash function, what's the best you can hope for to achieve in the security sense? So you want to have some hash function where the output is uniformly distributed. So that means if I pick random x and compute what y belongs to it, so what image they have, then each y has a 1 over the size of the set. Well, I'm taking strings of length n, so there are 2 to the n different strings of length n. So each y has the same chance of being the image of this uh, input, and that means it's a 1 over 2 to the n chance. Now if I have a specific one, so I'm looking at pre-image resistance, if I fix the y and I'm randomly sampling uh, x's to find a pre-image of this y, then each time I have a 1 over 2 to the n chance, so that means on average it will take 2 to the n calls to the hash function to find a pre-image. The story is very similar for second pre-images. Again, I have a y fixed, this time I know the x, but the best attack that I can come up with generically is again to sample random x and look where they land. The probability that I picked exactly that x is, is negligible, but I can also say, well, I pick an x prime not equal to x and look where it lands. That doesn't change my distribution much, so it still takes about 2 to the n calls 
to the function h to find the second frame. Now the last property, the collision resistance, that again changes. So in the collision resistance, we're looking at this bucket of 2 to the n elements, and then I want to invoke the Brewster paradox. So let me first explain what the Brewster paradox is. So the Brewster paradox says if you're taking from a bucket of m elements, well, you take it, you look at it, and you put it back, and you keep track of what you've looked at, then after taking about swirled as many, so if you have a hundred elements there, it would take about 10 draws till you find one element twice. That does not mean that you find the element A twice, it just means there is some element which comes twice. So up on this graph up there, uh, you can see the um, distribution for the Brewster paradox and this is the probability that all elements uh, that you did, that you have twice the same element. So at the beginning, of course, it's zero, but then there's a pretty steep increase, and then really getting to 100% takes a long, long time. But just looking at the 50% mark, that is much, much earlier. So that is where we're looking for getting at least 50% probability that you have picked the same element twice is after about square root of the number of elements. Now in our case the number of elements is 2 to the n, so we need about 2 to the n over 2, so not 2 to the n like in the other two, but only 2 to the n over 2 calls to the hash function to find a collision. So this one is much lower than the other one because we don't have any restriction. The other ones fix a certain y and then ask to find that y. In the collision resistance, we're allowed to pick any pair. And just for clarity, these are the highest possible complexities. So when you're designing a hash function, you cannot hope for achieving anything better than the Brewster bound on the collision resistance or two to the n for the preempt resistance. So if you hash, um, have a hash function with 32-bit output, then it takes only 2 to the 16 calls to find a collision. So your output has to be sufficiently long to make finding collisions computationally hard. So if you're concerned about attackers who can do 2 to the 128 operations, then you have to take outputs of, it length, of length at least 256. And of course, if you design a hash, bad hash function, or if you pick a bad hash function, then they might require far fewer operations to break. I'm not going to go into the details of how to break hash functions because most of those require a very detailed knowledge. What I'll show instead is a um, very standard way of designing hash functions, namely the Merkle-Dunga construction. This is at least for all the older hash functions, and that is including the SHA-256 and SHA-512 families that you see on the internet these days. Um, that is the background of this definition. But first we have to talk about how we actually hash data. I mean, yes, in theory we can hash arbitrary length messages, that's what the definition says, but when you have any construction, you have to implement it somehow, so you're storing these elements in a computer, so you have like registers or words um, that you want to fill, and so it makes sense that you're taking bigger chunks. Also remember with the stream ciphers, um, the Elvis R was going for output bits, but even there, when I was getting to the more modern ones, like with the Snow 3G, um, they were actually giving you a word of output. And similarly here, we'll be taking blocks of data. So there is some block size n, which is exactly the same n as the output size, and then we're taking our message, and, well, first of all, we are taking pieces where each block has length n starting from the beginning, so if our message is n0 till some ml minus 1, and the first block of this message that we're going to use is the first t bits, second block is, uh, is the first n bits, then the next n bits, and so on. Now, if your message doesn't have a multiple of n as a number, then you will, filling, you will be filling up with something else. And we have also encountered something like this. We have looked in the Playfair cipher, where we were looking at play, just pairs of letters, 
And there the rule was, if you find an unmatched letter, you add an X. And similarly here, the hash constructions do specify what you do to pad the message. Be it all zeros, or be it a one followed by all zeros, or be it a, something which also encodes the message length, that depends on the specifications of the hash functions and sometimes on the specifications on the outer function. But there is some rule of how you should do these padding bits so that everybody who computes the hash functions will choose the same padding bits. Okay, so that's enough to show you how the work done board construction is working. So we take this padded message, see the light purple blocks up there, and then the last one, well, the end of it might be including padding. And we're also picking an initialization vector. Now, in the case of hash functions, this ID is fixed and specified in the definition of the hash function. So this is not like in string service where you're sending the initialization vector along. This is just some fixed ID that everybody knows. It's just some value to get you started. And then for every block, you're doing the same operation. You're taking a chunk of the message, leaving M0, and you're taking something which gets passed in, so that's this hi, and then taking the message zero, message i, and this hi, and you're feeding this into a function c. And this function c is shown as a trapezoid, which is mapping from, from many bits to few bits. In our case, it's taking two n bits to n bits. n is again the length of the block, and it's the length of the output. So if you have a 256-bit function, a hash function, then it takes 512 bits in the compression function and produces 256 bits. So each step has the same property. It takes n bits of the message, n bits of the previous outputs, and maps them to n bits. So this is called a compression function or sometimes also a digest function. So a fingerprint or a digest are synonymous in cryptography. So you have something which is a short version of the long thing. Now, when you look at this thing, you notice a few properties. So you notice that there's a, an iterative design. And so if the C, if you can find a collision in C, so if you can construct M0 and M0 prime, so that both together with the IV give you the same H1, then we can actually expand this to a collision because if the beginning collides, if this M0 and M1 prime with the IV collides at the output H1, then you just feed the same M1, M2, M3, and you have two different messages with the M0 and M0 prime, so you have found a collision. So if C is not collision resistant, then H definitely is not. And now a nice feature is that it's actually also sufficient to have C be collision resistant. So if the C that is a much smaller function, don't have to worry about arbitrary length messages, you only worry about messages of length 2n, then you analyze this. If that one is collision resistant, then you also can conclude the whole hash function is collision resistant. There's also a beneficial design for implementations. You can build a small unit, which is this compression function, and then you can stream in the data. You don't have to know the data at the beginning. You can get it incrementally. Somebody can feed this to you over the internet and you're getting one block at a time. Or you have a, a big device which is holding the movie and you have a small device which is checking whether the data you've just downloaded is the correct data and it's just feeding it through quickly. We also used this feature in finding a partial SHA-1 collision. So that was actually an attack that we used. Um, if you like uh, small puzzles or attacks, do check out our write-up. So it is not a kind of cryptographically relevant collision. It is just showing the power of brute force and a little bit of, of smart brute force. So if you want to have something where you're getting close to some value of h. So collision would be both x and x prime mapped to the same hash. And a partial collision means you're getting, well, these match on many bits. This could be interesting if you're trying to compare fingerprints, because most people will go like, ah, if the first few bits are the same, if the last few bits are the same, it's probably the same. 
So partial collision could be useful to fool people into accepting one PGP key for another or something. Um, in this case, it was just a kind of a popularity measure by some online platform um, that was in the early days of Twitter and they wanted to get their name out there and so they ran a competition and had everybody tweet in their results. And the competition was to take words from a dictionary, so it was pre-formatted and then do a, a fixed thing of those and get close to some output where they allowed you to vary uh, the last three parts. And so what we did was we uh, picked words, we fixed those so that they would fit exactly the boundary of these blocks. And then we had some little bits to vary and the padding um, and we just computed on those. So we, we saved most of the computation of the hash function and just did this finalization part. Okay, little bits here and there. So um, where do we send these hash functions? So the uh, usage of hash functions beyond the looking up fingerprints uh, on the internet is in public key cryptography, in the use of public key signatures. So in the video I was talking about signing a message, but what you actually sign is that you sign the hash of the message. So the reason that these signature schemes can use arbitrary long messages is because they first hash them and then sign the hash. And so for public key signatures, it's kind of immediately obvious that this collision resistance is very, very important because if somebody could convince you to sign something which looks sufficiently innocent, saying, hey, can you give me an autograph? Okay, cryptographic autograph. Um, you might be willing to do that. Now, if they spend a lot of computer power or have used the weak hash function, then this innocent message and something that I crafted, which is probably something you don't want to sign, like I sell you my house for one dollar, um, map to the same hash. And so the signature that I just issued would be valid on this message as well as in that one. And that's a bad idea. Also in symmetric key authentication, which you can find in the video mess uh, on message authentication codes, um, we're using hash function in order to have a short fingerprint of the message. Um, so that's the, the main use of hash function cryptography beyond having some short handle to just well, check whether everything got worked on. So you see often when you're downloading data from the internet, you see a checksum. And just because cryptographic checksums are so much available in software, they also use these, even though they might actually not meet the, the properties. Now I've mentioned that there's some weak hash function, but let me start with some which I use and probably okay. So there's the older family of SHA-256, SHA-384 and SHA-512. So those were um, designed by the NSA from all the records we know, um, published by NIST. And um, they are in use, we don't know any weakness of them, so they're probably okay. Then NIST did run a competition, so a public um, call for proposals where then lots of the research community submitted proposals, spent several years on analyzing them, and that competition led to the selection of SHA-3, which, well, before that was known as Kachak, but also the other SHA-3 finalists uh, from all we know pretty okay. And for, for SHA-3, there's also a version Shake, which has more flexibility in the output length. So if you don't want one of the standard length, but once something intermediate, then shake gives you a better result than SHA-3. Another one in the same generation as the SHA-256 and SHA-512 family is SHA-1. So you still see that sometimes used for fingerprints, for instance, for Git or for PGP. However, that is not a secure hash function. One part is that the output is rather short. It's just 160 bits. But collisions were found or computed actually uh, in far less than 2 to the 8. So it's something on the scale of 2 to the 60. That's still a big computation, but it's something which has been done and you often can take one collision and turn it into something other by just using how file encodings work. So if you have uh, PDF files or something, there's a lot of data which you have freedom to choose and then you can take this kind of academic collision and turn it into a meaningful one for certain file encodings. 
Now, a more practical attack, which gives a lot more flexibility, is called chosen prefix collision, which means whatever you want for the beginning can be turned into a colliding pair. And that is just from earlier this year. Um, so that means SHA-1 is really insecure and should not be used anyway. We've seen something similar um, a few years earlier with MD5, which until then was still one of the most used hash functions. So collisions were found in 2004, and there had been a warning in fact in the 90s, in 1995, there was a warning saying, hey, there are some dodgy properties in MD5. We don't get collisions for the for the real IV for this initialization vector that comes into the Merkel-Dungott construction, but for other things we can construct something which shouldn't be there. Nevertheless, it was being used. Then collisions were found in 2004, which then led to a big uh, cleanup. So people trying to figure out where MD5 is being used. There was the MD5 task force in Microsoft. Um, and it was hard to get out, and it was sometimes even met with resistance, like people going like, yeah, but it's not so bad, it's just an academic thing. So in 2008, a team, which also involved some researcher from Eindhoven, um, Ben de Weger, uh, showed that you can turn these collisions into meaningful collisions, and what they created was a root CA certificate. So that means on the internet, when you go into a page and you want to make sure it's the right one, well, you look at the log. But the reason that you can trust the log is that, say, your bank has gotten um, a certificate saying, yep, bank, I know you are the bank and this is you, from some other authority. And that certification authority, there might be a chain, but there is like a top level, which is called the root CA, so certification authorities which are allowed to issue important certificates and they could fake a signature from this. And that showed that these collisions can be turned into something which is meaningful and that can be actually dangerous on the internet. And that then broke the resistance so most product cleans up, cleaned up. However, in 2012, bad things never die, um, in 2012 the flame malware was spreading by using a MD5 collision, not the one from the researchers I should highlight, so that whoever made this malware had found their own collision, and they used this to create a signature on a fake Windows update. And that then led to people installing this malware and, well, being infected. There's an older one, MD4, um, where collisions were found already earlier. So back in 1995, there were already efficient collisions. And then the same team, well, mostly Shaolin Wang, who found the MD5 collision in 2004, also showed a more efficient collision um, in 2004. And she was also the one who started uh, the downfall of SHA-1 by showing that certain properties that affect the MD4 and MD5 would also be affecting the SHA-1 and estimating the security as lower. And then the years between then and 2017, well, there has been some research, but also many people were busy with the SHA-3 competition. So the, the joke was that SHA-1 has been made artificially more secure by having people be distracted uh, or focusing their attention on the SHA-3 competition. And so it took longer to break it than it otherwise would have. But in any case, it was still a big computation. And throughout those years, the complexity was pushed down. So the actual effort to do the attack was lower in 2017 than it would have been in 2004. So there was a lot of, of research going into that. So that's all I wanted to say about cryptographic hash functions. Thank you for your attention.